done? Zero. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. It's your uh, host, Brendan Baylod from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. Um, we've got another show tonight. We are live from, uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Tonight's show is an all-Wisconsin show. Um, we'll uh, give it a few minutes for people to join. Uh, if you're online uh, watching us, give us, a, give us a couple of messages there to say hi. Let us know you're with us. Uh, looks like we've got two people so far, Chris. I think that would be me and you. <laughs> okay, good. That's a good start. All right. People are starting to join. All right. Well, we had uh, pretty good numbers for this show. A lot of people signed signed on. And Chris, it's been crazy the last week. I don't know if this is you coming on the show, but maybe it's the season. People are starting to join the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group again in huge numbers. Last, well, two years ago, three years ago, I started this thing, kind of with the idea that it would be for the real hardcore shipwreck geeks, you know, people who uh, like to find shipwrecks and um, own side scan sonars. And uh, I figured I'd get maybe 15, 20 of my friends on here and it'd be a private group and we could, you know, sort of tease each other about what we know about shipwrecks. And uh, people started to ask to join in huge numbers. And within, I think, two months, I had a thousand members. And I had to make a decision. Should I just let anybody in? And we said, yeah, we might as well. There seems to be a lot of interest in researching Great Lakes shipwrecks. So um, we plateaued there around 3,500 members. And in the last two weeks, and since I announced your show, it's gone way up. Do you mostly, butter all your, your guests up this way? It's mostly women, Chris. Okay, good. Yeah, my wife will love that. <laughs> we don't get a lot of girls in the Great Lake Ship Rest. Uh, group, no, they wouldn't guys. expect that. They're uh, far too sensitive. <laughs> mostly old guys, in fact. But um, no, a lot of young women are joining the group. So welcome. Uh, it's excellent to see that we're reaching out to our on, uh, outside of our traditional demographic. All right. Well, looks like we've got a pretty good number of people. I got some people from Green Bay on. I've got Caledonia, Wisconsin. I would guess that might be Bob Jake. Um, welcome, guys. Welcome to the show. And um, let's get rolling, shall we? A um, few, few housekeeping things. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's been posting to the group. Uh, as always, I, I just ask that if you're going to post your dive pictures underwater, put some historical context with them. Um, you know, the group is the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. So, you know, we try to we try to stick with that um, and keep to our topic. So I appreciate everyone's help in, in, in helping us do that. Um, also, uh, I don't have another uh, show lined up for next week. I think we may take next week off, but uh, it won't be long now. Uh, I'm going to go on summer hiatus for the show because then I start to go out and Look for racks and do other fun stuff on the lakes so uh, and everyone else does too so we kind of take a break from the summer um so those are the housekeeping things uh also uh there will be a zoom room after the show for those of you who are uh, wanting to uh, join and uh, uh, get to meet our, our special uh, guest um come and uh, join us in the zoom room i will post the link to it uh, after the show on the uh, group and um what else? If you uh, you know really like the show and you, you you just you know need to watch it again, Chris said something really profound uh, that you have to see again. You can watch it all over again on YouTube if you want. I'll have it uploaded there. So, all right. Well, tonight we've got a very special guest. Um, uh, it's a, a guy that I've known for for many years. Uh, one of my, my my old buddies from my Milwaukee days when I used to live in Milwaukee. Uh, it's none other than the uh, legendary photographer, author, and all-around maritime dude, Chris Winters. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, really privileged to have you. I, um, I uh, have, we worked together on a number of things over the years, and uh, I'm a big ad admirer of, uh, of Chris's photography, um, among other things, uh, because I, I take some, well, pictures and uh i have a very expensive fairly expensive camera and lenses and i don't know why but my pictures never look like chris's <laughs> so um in any event uh chris and i have uh have worked together uh oh gosh on uh, 
things for Discovery World, um, for the, uh, I can't remember, what was it? Oh, it was the uh, the Car Fair Milwaukee uh, thing. The, uh, uh, I used some of my uh, scrapbook stuff um, from the um, Car Fair Milwaukee scrapbooks that I have. And then uh, I think we worked together a little bit at the Ghost Ships Festival and a few other things. So it's a privilege to, to, to get back in touch with you, Chris, because after I moved to Madison, we kind of, you know, drifted apart. So, um, Chris, uh, the usual uh, uh, questions uh, for you um, that I always ask everybody, because the show's really kind of, it's about people. It's about getting to know people and their passions and, you know, kind of what makes them tick in the Great Lakes Maritime History community. So I'm going to ask you the same question I start out with with all our guests, and that is, um, you know, how the heck did you get interested in this? Because, you know, I, we were talking earlier, a lot of guys are interested, do, do golf. Some guys hunt, some guys fish. Uh, you like boats. Tell me, how did that happen, Chris? <laughs> uh, well, you and I both uh, hail from the copper country up on the Keweenaw there. My mother's people are all from Dollar Bay. And uh, although my grandfather relocated during the Depression down to Milwaukee where there was more work, uh, we would spend most summers up in the Keweenaw uh, visiting extended family. And although... I did not know that, Chris. Your family's from Dollar Bay? I went to Dollar Bay Elementary School. Yeah, yeah. Small world, isn't it? Wow. Uh, so so uh, one summer, uh, we would come back down and uh, we passed through Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, although none of, none of the family sailed, my, my great grandfather and grandfather both worked for the Copper Range Railroad. So they, they, uh, they did a fair amount back and forth between the, uh, the docks along the Keweenaw Waterway there. So the, you know, and the Keweenaw is sort of surrounded by Lake Superior on all sides. And of course the the Fitzgerald had sunk uh, when I was uh, uh, four years old, five years old. And so I, I recall very vividly my uh, grandfather worked for Schlitz beer. So there was just lots of Schlitz around and they would have these beer fueled debates uh, about what had happened. And it, you know, it really wasn't in the uh, misty past then. It was pretty, a fairly contemporary thing. And I, I think that got under my skin. And then the, in the summer of 1980, uh, that photo there on the screen, I was nine years old and I bought that, uh, and you'll see in the next slide here, this uh, well-worn copy of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald on the Valley Camp. They had the, still do actually have the lifeboats uh, from that were recovered uh, after the wreck. And uh, that book really put the hook in me. Uh, I can and see as that can, from the cover. It looks like it's well loved. Yeah. I read that book easily 10,000 times uh, in my youth. And uh, then I got, you know, I went to high school and I got interested in sports and girls and cars. And I kind of put it aside. And, and uh, I, uh, like a lot of people in their late, teens and early 20s, I was not entirely sure what I wanted to do with myself after high school. And uh, I dropped out of college after a year and I just sort of drifted around and uh, I discovered, rediscovered uh, casting around for uh, what to do next. Uh, I kind of rediscovered my interest in maritime history, Great Lakes maritime history. So um, I got certified in 1993 and uh that you know at, at that point i sort of started to put together what i had been reading about and i and i i've been a, a reader since i was a little kid i just i love to read and i had I'd read a lot uh, a lot of uh, the classics uh, by the, by that point uh, you know, shipwreck great lakes shipwrecks and survivals and Dwight Boyer's books and uh, uh, Stonehouse's stuff, uh, Wes Olszewski early on. Uh, and so it was really wild to, to, to be able to kind of go and see for yourself uh, some of these places. 
underwater. And of course, we're blessed in Milwaukee. We have uh, two of the best wrecks in Lake Michigan, in my my opinion. So uh, we had some really excellent uh, diving right in the backyard. And I met, a, sort of providentially met a group of guys, uh, one of whom was my instructor and uh, one other friend who had a boat. And uh, we sort of formed this group uh, and, and uh, went at it hammer and tong for a couple of seasons. And uh, we're probably a pretty dangerous bunch initially because we had way more, uh, how to say, youthful, foolish, bravado and of course access to a boat and a brand new instructor and and uh, so we uh, after we survived that first year uh by the the rest of the the time we dove together we had some pretty pretty interesting adventures and and i'm careful to to uh, point out I'm, I'm grateful in retrospect uh that we started when we did because it was before the zebra mussels really got a foothold uh, of course they were already in Lake St. Clair in the early 90s, but they hadn't really made it to Lake Michigan, at least in great numbers yet. So my earliest, most uh, formative and indelible memories of, of Great Lake shipwreck diving here, at least, uh, is sort of rooted in that unique, uh, uh, frozen in time sort of thing. Uh, ambiance where they weren't encrusted like they are now and the paint was there and the small artifacts were still very you know very present and obvious and uh, there was a sense of mystery too that it, it occurred to me not, not all that long ago that although we used to complain about the sort of miserable uh, visibility especially on, on the on the wreck of the Milwaukee uh, there was a certain mystery to it when you we were exploring it. It's a pretty big wreck, and and of course it's all bent out and exploded, and, uh, and of course it's a whole train wreck. It's a whole shipwreck and a whole train wreck. And to explore that five feet at a time uh, was very mysterious and sort of creepy. And uh, now, twenty years later, uh, when we have on average, I, I'm guessing the visibility out there now is fifty feet, and you can see beam to beam, and it's just not the same somehow. Um, strangely enough, you, you wouldn't think uh, someone would complain about such a thing. And then, of course, the fact that the hull is, is uh, coated now almost entirely with uh, quagga mussels, uh, it's just not the same. Then, so, fortunately, fortunately, Lake Superior has dodged the bullet, so that that, uh, that area is still pristine. So, Chris, uh, you know, like you said, Milwaukee, amazing wrecks with the, the Willie and the, and the car ferry in Milwaukee, obviously. You and I share a lot of the same history there. I think we both started diving down there um, right around the same time, too. But one of the things that you did that was really interesting to me is you, you, you took a turn and started to get really interested in maritime culture, life on the water. And, uh, you know, uh, you started to explore more um, about the people. And uh, that really, uh, really captured my interest. You know, how, how did that happen? And uh, tell us about that part of your, uh, your, your work. Well, um, I worked a full time in a dive shop from uh, 1995 and 1996 and I had it was just a, it was the time of my life it was just a tremendous couple of seasons but as anyone who's worked in a dive shop in this climate knows there's you know not much happening in the winter months and uh, so that just was not a sustainable career I, I wasn't interested in becoming an instructor so I, at that point I had I had uh, picked up a camera yeah, as a method of just sort of documenting what we were doing on our dive excursions around the lakes. And uh, uh, I not <laughs> my career, such as it is, uh, not only straddles the zebra mussel influx, it also straddles the uh, sort of quantum shift in photography from film-based photography to, to our current uh, digital platform. And so back in the old days, before the, the shift, uh, buying and processing film was expensive. 
especially if you were broke, uh, sort of a dive bum as I was in those years. Uh, so I got a job at a camera store and uh, that at least offset the cost of my film processing. And after a year or two in that environment, which is largely a retail environment, and of course, in the, especially at the holidays, it's a, basically a living hell day to day. Uh, it was clear to me that there's a tremendous gap between being a camera salesman, retail salesman, and being a photographer. And uh, the store I, I was working at, fortunately, uh, saw a little bit of business, even though it was a consumer camera store. They saw some lab business uh, from professionals who were working on the west side of town. So one gentleman in particular who would bring his E6 film in to be processed uh, and was very obviously a, a professional. Uh, I got to know him conversationally and, and uh, at that point I started writing him these sort of desperate letters saying, look, I'll carry your bags for free. I just want to get out of this hell hole. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, if you ever need an assistant, I learn best that way, you know, sort of uh, experientially. Let me know, please, uh, if you ever need uh, a hand. And that uh, fell on deaf ears for well, at least at, I don't know, six months or a year. And then out of the, the clear blue sky, that would have been in uh, 1998, he called me up and said, look, my former assistant has taken another position. And if you're still interested, uh, why don't you come down? His studio was down by the old Greyhound station. And you had to be downtown in those years because that's where all the commercial labs were. So I just thought the great thing since sliced bread and I dove into my position as his assistant uh, uh, full hog. And, and he was a tremendous teacher and genuinely invested in my success. Uh, and, and of course, he also taught me how to run a small business as well as how to... Uh, become a photographer when one thing that's kept me uh, helped me keep uh, body and soul together all these years is the ability to kind of make it however meagerly as a commercial quote unquote commercial photographer and uh, one thing he one of his uh, sort of tenants was uh, if you know that when you're working commercially you're basically a tradesman you're a plumber with a camera and you have tools and you show up and you you do your job and you make your client happy and you do what they want you to do with the camera. And that's fine. And that's how you pay the bills. However, creatively, if you have some, as I did, uh, a bit of the artist in you, that can be frustrating, the committee thinking and the fact that you usually don't have a free hand in what you're creating. Uh, so uh, as a way to counterbalance that, create a sort of a personal vision project and, and an avocational project that uh, will keep your creative spirit alive. Uh, and he was a, uh, he specialized in architectural interiors and portraiture. So uh, as an exercise initially, I did two things. One was, and the one especially has been very helpful all this time. I, I started out volunteering my time uh, when they were building the Dennis Sullivan downtown as the volunteer photographer. And then I also began a, uh, a portrait series called, I called it Faces of the Lakes. Uh, it's my working title. And uh, as I got to know, I had already been you know, diving a few years and then sort of had started traveling to different uh, maritime events and had started to cross paths with different people who were connected to Great Lakes maritime life in some fashion. Initially, it was mostly diving people. And then I sort of through the net wider from there. And uh, that, although unconsciously, uh, that project served as a sort of a, I'm not I'm sort of an introvert by nature. I'm not very gregarious. And uh, so this, this project allowed me to kind of network with people in a way that I was comfortable in. It was very kind of a one-on-one -on -one uh, sort of a cultivation of a relationship before I would make the picture. And uh, it was a way to practice my craft. And then uh, 
a way to, to kind of meet people and get to know them a little bit. And uh, so the first guy I tapped because I didn't, I didn't have, I was very uncomfortable with my skill level at that point. I wanted to be able to fail in a way that wasn't going to be too excruciating. So I called Jerry Geyer up um, uh, and I said, all right, you know, I'd, I'm starting on this thing and can you help me out? Can you hold still for me uh, while I take this picture? And at this point he was one of the, volunteer uh, people uh, uh, who was looking for the Linda E. The Linda E. had gone missing in, it was in 97 and they hadn't found it. And he had, uh, he was friendly with the, the Weeboard family and they wanted closure uh, on that situation. So there were several private individuals who were uh, looking for the Linda E. Uh, at that time. So I, I remember I that really it. well. I, I went out with uh, Harry Zeke at that time looking for the Linda E. And, uh, yeah. I remember yep. Jerry uh, being out there, and uh, and it was a sad story, but a, a really good thing that it, that it was found, and those families got to have some resolution. Right. And of course, you can't see much of the environment in this photo, but <laughs> that was the old dock there uh, on Water Street. Of course, they're all condos now, but uh, at this sure. time, uh, it was it was still his Jerry's dock, the original Jerry's dock. Uh, and then Dennis Hale was the next. Uh, I, I did some got some other. Uh, photos under my belt. And then I approached Dennis, who I'd got to know uh, in the, uh, the middle 90s. Uh, and I had this image in my head of, of how I wanted to photograph him. And, and I felt like I knew him well enough. And even though it might bring up some traumatic uh, memories that I wanted to photograph him wearing essentially what he was wearing that night uh, when the morale went down, which would have been that navy pea coat and pair of shorts and his wow. life jacket and uh we went so far as i found a coat that fit him and and uh we were chasing around in fairport ohio looking at the actual life jacket his actual life jacket was in the fairport maritime museum at the time when the weather finally cooperated to do the photo it was sunday and we couldn't get the uh, life jacket so like the life jacket he has there is not actually from the, the the morale life jacket, but uh, it gives you some to me that some sense of, of uh, what it what how uh, preposterous uh, the fact that he survived that experience in that freezing cold water uh, with you know virtually half naked uh, uh, that I, I wanted to kind of bring that home you know, to people. Well, that picture definitely does. And this fellow too. Now this this story is ongoing, and in fact, I, I have to do some legwork on this this summer. Hopefully, this is T.D. Vanette, who was probably the first hard hat diver in the Upper Peninsula. He built his first rig uh, based on a popular mechanics article that came out in 1932, and he set himself up in business recovering things that fell off the iron ore docks there, the railroad uh, loading docks, and then he joined the Navy. Uh, when the war broke out, he went to salvage school out in New York City. He worked, he moonlighted on the salvage of the Normandy uh, in New York Harbor. And then he was part of the original uh, UDT uh, group that was sent to the Pacific and in North Africa and in, in Europe as well. Uh, so he was, he went in ahead of uh, the UDT guys would go in ahead of the landing force and they would uh, blow up anti-tank uh, emplacements and, and other things, entanglements that were set up to hinder the uh, amphibious landings, uh, both in, in, he was in North Africa and then they sent him to the Pacific. Uh, so he was uh, at Iwo Jima and all the big famous battles uh, a day before uh, the invasion, blowing things up clandestinely. And uh, then he, and this is where the story gets weird because I, I got to know him and uh, I did a piece, uh, an article in Great Laker magazine. Uh, this would have been about the year 2000. And I was, I went to his home in Escanaba and uh, the, the heart of his story. And he published a self, it was a self-published memoir called Deep Water Man. In yeah, 1999. Got it. And he was sworn to secrecy by the Navy for 50 years after the war. So 1999 comes, he's 50 years is up and he's, his daughters encouraged him for the sake of his grandkids to write his experiences down, which he did. And uh, the heart of the book is this uh, rescue of the crew of the, the submarine uh, 
the USS Pickerel off the island of Japan in 1944, I think late 1944, and the use of, uh, I can't think of the name of the bell, it was a rescue bell that had only been used once or twice in, in real world application. And uh, they sent the bell down and uh, in order to make sure that it's seated on the sub's uh, escape trunk properly, he went down in hard hat gear, something like almost 400 feet, and made sure that the bell seated properly and they rescued the crew and he was awarded the navy cross by admiral kincaid himself who pinned it to his diving and he had pictures of all this pinned the medal to his diving underwear and uh then he came he he was bent horribly after that he couldn't dive anymore so he came back and founded the Vanette boat works uh in, in Escanaba, that was in the news recently, the Harbor Seagull, if you follow uh, yep. local events here on our waterfront, uh, sank at her dock just recently. That was a Vanette boat. Sure. And uh, so anyway, I, I published the article, and some years later, I got an email from a guy, and I, I have to look him up again. It was many, you know, a lot of years have gone past. But he said basically that he had done some research and had even been in Pearl Harbor, and that there's no record of the USS Pickerel being the crew being rescued and it's listed as lost at sea. And there was all this weird stuff that came out of the woodwork so, after the story. And I, I have to kind of follow up to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, put a finger on what exactly was going on there. All right. Well, Chris, we, we we're just about halfway through, so we need to. Okay. Take <laughs> I can, I um, can go on. <laughs> well, that's all right. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of your work when you got involved in uh, uh, shipwreck searching. Uh, there's some fascinating work that you've done with the Great Lakes uh, Shipwreck uh, Historical Society. Yeah. And there I was lucky too. Uh, that portrait project led to an introduction to Tom Farnquist, who was the executive director of the Shipwreck Society at that time. I did a portrait of him with the bell. The Fitzgerald bell had been recovered two years before. And uh, I became sort of like with the Dennis Sullivan, I became the sort of volunteer photographer for the organization. And eventually I was asked to join the board of directors. And, and uh, as my work in exhibits and, and the design um, stuff sort of uh, became more diversified. I, I started working with them on, on a variety of uh, projects apart from, from just straight up photography. So uh, initially we had a grant uh, to, to create uh, a series of archaeological, underwater archaeological surveys of five wrecks that we identified as, as uh, very historically significant in, in or, or near Whitefish Point up on Lake Superior. So we uh, started out with our what at the time was a really G whiz uh, uh, high frequency sonar, marine sonic sonar, and we we towed that uh, over the five wrecks. Started out with sonar imagery, which was sort of a new thing in 2002, 2001, and uh, uh, then a survey, uh, actual you know, old fashioned survey diving, and then uh, Pat Laverty was our archaeologist of record. He did site drawings. And then uh, to me, as a frustrated, I, I dabbled in maritime painting, actual like maritime art, and was lousy at it. Uh, but I had great respect for Ken Marshall, who was the artist who uh, uh, is most probably best known for, for uh, illustrating the Titanic uh, when it was discovered in the late 80s. And uh, the society hired him to create uh, these underwater uh, scenes uh, based on our research and uh, that was just uh, to this day it, it, it is one of the things I'm most proud of being involved in because he can recreate even in the age of digital underwater photography and, and quagga muscles and, and high performance LED lighting uh, he can reanimate an underwater site in a way that, that no technology uh, no imaging technology can so uh, he created five underwater paintings. Uh, we hired Bob McGreevy, who's a, a, one of the best known uh, regional uh, maritime artists to uh, recreate the vessel as it would have looked in life, uh, if you will, before the wreck. And then uh, I, I uh, created a, a series of uh, split view above and below uh, images in, in Photoshop. Uh, with wow. The, the vessel as a 
was and the vessel as it is. And then we, by uh, one of the stipulations of the grant was we had to create a booklet that was distributed free of charge. Uh, so we created this. This is my first attempt at laying a book out, uh, a book called uh, Ghosts of the Shipwreck Coast. You, you so, laid that book out, Chris? I wasn't aware of that. that I did. I did that right before I did my first. It was sort of my uh, my training wheels uh, before I did Centennial. Uh, that is just an excellent publication. It's one of the, yeah. the, the, the really the most striking pieces of of Great Lakes Maritime shipwreck um, interpretation and artwork I've ever seen. Um, yeah, and the, the credit there really goes to Tom. As with many things, he was the visionary. Tom Farnquist was the visionary on that one. And uh, he put together that it was just an all-star team of people. And uh, I think the work to this day, or many years later, it's probably one of the best things I've ever been involved in. Yeah, for those of you who don't have it, is it still available, Chris? I yeah, we, we finally did reprint it. So I think you can get it, uh, you can get it at the uh, uh, museum and on the museum's website. Yeah, this is just a beautiful book. And uh, wow, I didn't know you, you that you laid this out. I knew you were involved. Um, and I knew Pat was involved. That's how I got my copy. But what a what a what a contribution, Chris. It was truly once in a lifetime. Yeah, I think I think at this stage. Uh, Definitely. And then that's that same summer I was working on. Uh, I had just finished that and, uh, and spending a lot of time up there with uh, Tom. We found uh, <laughs> I have bad luck with shipwreck hunting. I was supposed to be with them and I, I forget what came up. I was chasing the wire center, the, some some other vessel and I couldn't go along that day and they found the Cyprus <laughs> that day. Uh, so I missed that uh, uh, moment. I still, well, I have achieved many things uh, that I set out to do. Uh, however, the thing that has eluded me is being involved, directly involved in the discovery of a a really interesting virgin shipwreck <laughs> that, that yeah. bucket list evades me yet to this day. Yeah, it's most of them are deep now, but uh, yes. I know one of the yeah. things that that you've really done a lot of work on, and and, and um, another great contribution is your work on the car ferry in Milwaukee. And uh, I know we collaborated a bit on that. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, and and like. Uh, Whitefish, uh, I stand on the shoulders of someone else the, uh, with my interest in, well, sir, the story of the Milwaukee is, is second to none. I mean, it's like the Fitzgerald. You couldn't write better fiction if you were going to sit down and write a shipwreck tale. Um, and so I, I as a, a, a diver early on, it's a fascinating shipwreck. And then as I got more into the history side of it, uh, I was introduced to, there's we have this sort of Milwaukee car ferry mafia here uh, <laughs> fellas who, who when the boats were still operational in and out of our harbor uh, would ride the boat and, and sort of took it upon themselves to preserve the history of the you know this sort of hundred years of year-round car ferry operations uh, in and out of uh, a handful of ports on this coast and uh, so i got to know uh, archivez uh, and, oh and, sure Doug Goodyear, uh, and and so we, uh, getting to know them certainly uh, made the experience of diving the Milwaukee a much richer uh, undertaking because you and really you guys were you were taking groups out on the Sullivan as I remember to these shipwreck sites and uh, right. showing underwater ROV and and side scan, uh, yeah. amazing work. That was something you know. Uh, it was never, a, never. A, it was sort of a prototype program. We would bring a group of school kids out on the Dennis Sullivan, use it as a platform to do. Uh, it was a program called Eyes in the Deep, and uh, we would do ROV work where the kids could actually run the ROVs, and then we'd have divers in the water uh, that they could observe. And then Kevin Cullen, my good buddy, who was at the time the our staff archaeologist. Uh, uh, he would do this sort of interpretive program on the Sullivan on the deck of the Sullivan. So we did the Milwaukee and then the, the Christmas tree ship, the Rouse Simmons. And, and that was a method uh, of, of sort of making the history come alive. And, and I've always felt uh, there's a great, apart from the maritime history component, uh, there's a lot of gee whiz uh, technology and science that you can sort of hook kids in with the death and destruction. And then you can also, you know, maybe stealth them into listening about science and, and uh, ecology and, and uh, some other disciplines uh, at the same time. So that, that 
program was developed to uh, undertake that sort of curriculum. And unfortunately, the Sullivan is just not a very dynamic platform for right. doing that sort of work. So it sort of sputtered out after a couple, three years. But uh, at the initially, it was it was interesting to at least uh, try to pull pull that off. Well, I remember this image right here because I, I use this image in my book, uh, Fathoms Deep. Um, this is the car from Milwaukee, right? With a radial sonar. Um, That's it. Uh, yeah, it's called sector scanning. And we brought a, a gentleman in from Michigan uh, who specialized in this type of uh, scanning. We were looking for train cars. And so we had drop a tripod, basically, and uh, it has a high frequency sonar head on it and uh, spins in 360 degrees. And as you can see, it's like most high frequency uh, hardware. It's its uh, ability to render detail is quite tremendous. You can see all sorts of broken railing, you know, fairly small stuff uh, yeah. very, very clearly on the bottom uh, in the pilot house structure there, which is blown off the, the wreck. Uh, very high. Yeah. Frequency. Never, never did find any train cars. No, I know uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that you've collected. Uh, this is the actual uh, text of the, the, uh, the message from A.R. Satan, the purser, the flicker is yeah. flat, the rolls about the same as, as last time. This is, uh, how did you uh, locate this stuff, Chris? Well, th this was Art Chavez, all Art Chavez. Yes, that's right. he, uh, he had spent years, he, he had seen, uh, a, there were facsimiles of this note that were used in the uh, court proceedings mm -hmm. after the lawsuits after the wreck. And uh, he had, he grew up right um, Maple Street down by the yeah. docks there. And he had seen uh, a facsimile of this note when he was a kid. And uh, we used to go diving. And uh, if any of you remember Bob Ducro, we'd sit in the hot tub and talk about the Milwaukee. And where do you think happened to that note? And uh, Art spent years digging around looking for, for that original note. And then he was convinced at one point that it had been lost and there was a fire in the National Archive in St. Louis. And he was convinced that it had been burned up in that fire. And then he was researching something about sea gates. He was doing that piece that yeah, one yeah. that I'm looking for. And uh, he was just going through old court proceedings, looking for material about sea gates in the discussion about raising the sea gate and the sea gate was too low and on and on like that. Well, sure enough, in the midst of all of these, I mean, and this is true, that anyone who does research has to appreciate the dedication of going through all this mind numbing uh, material that has no real relevance to what you're working on. And then <laughs> miraculously in the midst of all of this giant pile is this glassine envelope. And in the envelope is the original note from the purser, um, the Milwaukee, uh, depending on whose theory you subscribe to, the vessel uh, was sinking by the stern. They lost power in the storm, which is about the worst thing that can happen to you. So they have a few minutes to reckon with the fact that they are probably doomed. And uh, the, interestingly enough, ironically enough, all of, most of the ferries had, during the First World War, they had radio equipment. Yeah. Uh, so, some of the only vessels to have radio in those years, on the Great Lakes at least. And then they, they took it all off after the war. So uh, the the Milwaukee, I believe they left the receiver, and correct me if I'm, if I'm remembering this, only, they left the receiver, but they, they took the transmitter, so there was no radio. So they fell back on this ancient sort of uh, message in a bottle technology, this brass message case, uh, cork lined uh, with the ship's name on it. And A.R. Satan was the purser who kind of had the, the ship's records. And uh, he wrote this very haunting, I have said it's very haunting, very it terse. Very. What, goes, what goes through a man's mind at a moment like that? And, and uh, this wonderful haunting understatement at the end, uh, things look bad. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So he, he, basically his, his main uh, uh, attempt or effort in this, in this act is to let people know who is aboard the ship. So they survivor and survivor, if they're assuming they all went down with the ship, the people would at least know who was on the vessel when it sank. Oh, what a and, tremendous artifact this is and a find. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. So, so our found, uh, Found the thing and the archives didn't know they had it and they let us scan it and hold it and uh <laughs> and uh then the uh this is again the uh the the measure of the man uh 
I was like, well, okay, here's this note. And what do you think? Have you ever seen a picture of A.R. Satan? What did the guy look like? Who was he? Yeah. And so I started calling everyone named Satan. He knew he was from Cleveland. And he called everyone in the Cleveland phone book named Satan. And sure enough, oh, yeah, that was Uncle, Uncle, I forget what the guy's first name was. But sure enough, and they found, he found his descendants. And so we now have two pictures of, of A.R. Satan. Wow. Uh, first. That's a, just a great piece of research and a, a tremendous yeah. story. Um, very fortunate that, you know, Art was able to dig that up. So, yeah. um, Chris, uh, one of the other things that I know we wanted to talk about is, uh, are the, really the, the, the books that you've done. So you've been involved in so much, so it's, it's really kind of hard to, you know, know what to talk about next with you because you, 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 you're a photographer, you're, a you know, you've been involved up in Lake Superior with shipwrecks down here off Milwaukee, but um, one of the things that you're best known for really are your contributions with um, your books and you know your photography in those books is just stunning and I'd like to talk about those and give you a chance to really dive into those. Um, one of my favorites is your book Centennial. Can you tell us about uh, this project and um, sure. how you get involved in it? Sure. This gets to the heart of my Fred Stonehouse complex. So I, from the age of nine, I wanted to write books. I was a reader and I wanted to, I, before I was a photographer, I wanted to be a writer. And uh, interesting, I mean, so I back that up. I'm not a writer as such a storyteller. And so I kind of hit on this formula of using pictures. It, it became increasingly obvious, painfully obvious to me as I got older that people read less and less, right? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll I'll start incorporating visuals so maybe people will stay awake. And uh, so that was, that was my, my theory at least. And uh, I, I like anyone who's really into steamboats on the great lakes. I got a copy in the late nineties of a uh, photographer. I'm a great admirer of David uh, Plowden. I got a copy of his book, end of an era, which was a black and white. <clears throat> he works as well. well. Yeah. Great black and white. He's, he's a master photographer and he tracked uh, the last of what were the the last coal fired steamboats on the Great Lakes. This would have been in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, so my, uh, uh, although I, I make it sound like this was very obvious to me that, that this is how it was going to go. The fact of the matter is I had no clue that this was going to happen to me. I started one way and then I wound up being pulled in an entirely different direction, which is to say I started out working on the book I'm finishing right now as we speak in <laughs> 2000, 2001. And then in the act of doing that, I was doing some stuff in order to offset some of the cost. I was doing some shooting over at the shipyard in Sturgeon Bay. And uh, one evening I went over there to shoot the Mackinac, the old uh, the original icebreaker was in the dry dock for the last time. And I wanted to take some photos of that. Uh, she had that very unique bow propeller. And uh, so I went about my business uh, that evening, got my pictures. And then uh, in came this, at that time, she was known as the South Down Challenger. This would have been in uh, 2003, the summer of. So she was due for a five year hull inspection. And uh, it occurred to me uh, as they were parking the boat that uh, if the boat passed its five year, that it was entirely, the boat was 97 years old at the time, launched in 1906. Uh -huh. And uh, if the boat passed the five year, that based on how much it costs to do such a thing, that there was an absolutely uh, excellent chance that she would become the first vessel on the Great Lakes to operate a hundred years in, in service as a, you know, a self-propelled freighter. The EM Ford, which was launched in 1898, came close. Uh, she sailed until 1996 uh, and then was uh, laid up as a storage hull uh, in Saginaw, Michigan. So th th it seemed to me that this was something uh, that hadn't happened yet, but might happen. And so I got in on the ground floor. I took these two images we're looking at now uh, in the old way, uh, in sort of the spirit of Plowden, I did these with a large format camera of the vessel in the dry dock, and then I did two images in the engine room uh, the next day, and I sent those down to the fleet office and uh, said, hey, uh, this is a great story I, I see on the horizon here. Can I ship out 
with the vessel and uh, document life on the boat as it runs up to its 100 year anniversary. And I was very lucky. I, my, the story of my career is somehow I manage uh, and only by providence, I, I think. So it just turned out that the VP of operations at Hannah's Marine at that time was a total steamboat geek. Uh, uh, Ed Hogan, who again, he's one of my original patrons uh, who put up with my crazy ideas and, and said, yeah, kid, go for it. And so I shipped out in November of 2003 and I spent uh, four seasons on the boat as, oh. as much as I could. Did you shooting. work at all, or were you just shooting? Well, they, this is where I'm lucky. And, and all of all of these projects are, are intertwined. I I was working for Discovery World at that point. Discovery okay. World and Dennis Sullivan had become something much bigger. Uh, a a well-known philanthropist got involved uh, in about the year 2000, right after the boat was launched, and the project became much bigger than any of us ever dreamed of in, in the 90s when we were building the Dennis Sullivan. So suddenly there was a job there for me as the staff photographer. And they were indulgent because so much of what we do there, or much of it uh, is sort of maritime history based. Right. They uh, it will put up with my disappearing on the Challenger at a moment's notice uh, whenever something interesting was happening. So, so when you were on the Challenger, you really were just taking pictures. They didn't make you work as a deckhand? Correct. I thought of that. I, I, I imagined when I was working on the original project, I thought about using that method. And then it was evident quickly, especially this is right at the dawn of digital. And the way you took traditional pictures at this stage was so clumsy and yeah. slow that there would have been no way you could have been a deckhand and a photographer at the same time. So I'm extremely lucky that I was able to function as a pure observer uh, this photo we're looking at here, this is when I, I mentioned several times this sort of uh, quantum leap uh, where digital became something unto itself. Uh, this image was taken about four o'clock in the morning in South Chicago, uh, a, a vessel underway in the mostly dark on a bridge that is vibrating as traffic goes over it. Now, in the film days, this would have been a blurry, unidentifiable mess. There's no way you would be able to, to get an image on film uh, in this sort of environment. But because digital, the digital medium is so much more uh, sensitive to light, uh, you were able to take pictures that you simply couldn't take a year or two before uh, the, the first uh, really groundbreaking digital camera came out uh, about 2002, the Canon 1DS Mark One, and I ponied up all the money I had in the world and uh, bought that camera. And uh, it was clear to me from the get go that you were going to be able to take pictures that had never been taken before because the technology simply didn't exist. So this was the first image that sort of announced that wow. change. And it is a, just a beautiful image. And uh, um and so you have a couple of other uh, books you did too after you did uh, Centennial. Um, you did uh, a book on uh, the Fitz and then of course Schooner Days. Uh, um. Yeah, I kind of went back to the future then, which is to say, I don't, kinda, uh, I, I don't have any real, I don't have any real careful strategy for any of this stuff. Uh, it seemed in, in terms of getting back to my roots, uh, the Fitz was the first. The Fitz is like Mount Everest. It's like anyone who ever got into this stuff has some dream of trying something. It's been done and done and done to death, maybe. But you, you, in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that there are many other stories that are incredibly compelling, there's always something about the Fitzgerald that pulls you in. And uh, so I, I took my stab at it with Bruce Lynn, who's the current executive director of the uh, Shipwreck Museum, uh, and then I went all the way back. Uh, and it, were it not for Schooner Days, is all about the construction of the Dennis Sullivan, and uh, that is basically the uh, culmination of 25 years of work. Uh, a lot of it early on isn't very good because I was learning my trade, but uh, uh, so I've kind of covered myself now in terms of my roots, and and so now, interestingly enough, the the next project is the one I. I started originally in 2000, uh, which is about the iron ore trade on, on the Great Lakes and, and kind of tells that story through two very uh, signature lake boats, the Wilfred Sykes and the Edward L. Ryerson. Uh, 
that was supposed to be out last year, but our fabulous pandemic uh, intervened. If anyone's really interested, the gallery show that is supposed to go with the book is currently running at uh, the Wisconsin Marine Museum in Manitowoc, so you can see the gallery images. But uh, the book may be a few months yet, or who knows how long, until the wheels are back on here. Of the sure. economy. Uh, this photo has a good story. This is the Ryerson at uh, Johnson's Point on you know, the St. Mary's River. This is before drones. And uh, this is the hardest photo I think I ever took and most expensive, probably. My dream was to get the Ryerson at this sort of interesting point in the river at sort of full peak uh, fall color. And so fall of 2007 uh, comes around and uh, I had I was very lucky to develop uh, great working relationships with the captain and a couple of the mates. So they would call me when they were heading into the river. And if it looked like it was going to line up with good uh, sort of evening light and the color, you, you know, get online. And I don't know how you did would do any of this before the Internet and, and uh, satellite weather and AIS and uh, some of the other technology I can bring to bear. And, and uh, so the first th three times I tried this photo, now, I live in Milwaukee. Uh, I, I chartered the airplane out of St. Agnes, Michigan. So it's about an eight-hour drive. I would get in the car, drive to St. Agnes, get in the airplane, go up in the air, and something would happen. The boat would be late or the clouds, you know, the sun would disappear. Uh, the third time, the boat never showed up at all. I still don't know exactly what happened. And I, I would go home in defeat each time. And finally, the fourth time, uh, it all came together. And uh, the, the color was just right. And the boat arrived right in the best light of the day. And then it was interesting because we turned around after I had it and uh, we flew back to St. Ignace and a snowstorm came just, I mean, literally by the time I got back to the airport, I'm pretty sure every one of those leaves was knocked down by the next day because it was a big storm came through. What an amazing story that is, which you had to go through and just to get a shot before. The yeah, well, now you'd probably put a drone up and it'd be a lot easier, but uh, not, in, not in 2007. That's an incredible story. So. What we have, um, you know, uh, last year's a, a number of really cool Daniel J. Morrell shots that, uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what these are showing? Yeah, currently the, the, the push we have on, again, disrupted, uh, derailed by the coronavirus. Uh, last year we were supposed to debut our Daniel J. Morrell exhibit at the Shipwreck Museum. Uh, Dennis donated his collection uh, to the Shipwreck Museum after he passed in 2015, or his uh, widow did. And so that's actually his life jacket there in the case. Yep. And so that's, yeah, right. that's that, yeah, and it's so part of this uh, exhibit will will include a lot of this. This is like personal stuff that no one probably has ever seen. This is a photo of him in the hospital the next day with his feet all bandaged stuff, calling probably his wife saying, you know, I'm okay. And uh, so I'm working with Bruce right now. In fact, I'm going up next weekend to kind of hash out the panels and, and uh, how do we incorporate uh, three-dimensional artifacts and... Uh, uh, that, uh, barring the unforeseen, that exhibit will finally debut uh, this summer in August, if I'm not mistaken. Very cool. And I know you've done a, you've done quite a bit of photography out there. I know we had Becky Keg and Schott on the show and um, mentioned that um, you've uh, gone out there with her to the uh, Morel, correct? Yeah, and that was in the spirit of winding things up here. I haven't had any new ideas for a book in a long time be a decade. I've, I've kind of sketched out, I have seven or eight different ideas and I've been following them for decades. Well, I haven't had any new ideas. And it always seemed odd to me that I, uh, when I got into all this, it was truly through my interest in shipwrecks. And uh, I had many ideas about writing a book about shipwrecks, my Fred Stonehouse complex, and it never quite panned out. I could never find the thread. And uh, I continued to collect things and research and have experiences and meet people. And uh, I am, in order to keep body and soul together, and anyone who dives knows diving is expensive. So uh, my best friend from high school carved out this weird specialty. We were watch geeks from all the way back in high school. We loved diving watches. And so he actually became a specialist. He writes and travels all over the world uh, testing and writing about uh, high-end timepieces. So we pay the bills to go diving by writing and, and photographing dive watches, which is usually pretty boring stuff. It takes <laughs> place in the water and it's mostly still life photography. However, in 2018, uh, we, uh, he, uh, Jason got hooked up 
uh, and introduced to Becky, he was trying to pitch a story to Outside Magazine. She's an extraordinary diver, cave diver, really compelling individual, very, very interesting person. And he, he thought that what she was doing was just as interesting as anything they publish in Outside about, uh, you know, extreme mountaineering or anything like that. So we collaborated on getting together and diving the Daniel J. Morrell. Uh, she happened to be running a charter over there with she has she basically works as a dive guide i guess you could say and so we we connected over uh, over on the thumb and uh, we went out and had a, for me it was a, i had something i had on my bucket list for a long time i got to know dennis very well over a period of 20 years and i had never actually seen the morale with my own eyes i had only lived the experience sort of through his his uh, telling of the tale and uh, so not, not only did we have a, a really great excuse to go do that, but we got to go along and observe these world-class uh, Becky and uh, Yitka. Huh? Uh, a lot of local folks know Yitka. Uh, these are world-class divers. And uh, so Jason and I kind of came along as the runts of the stable and, and took photos of them taking photos. I got to <laughs> share this, you know, these really – it's very complicated and tremendous amount of equipment. And of course there were diving rebreathers. Uh, so there's no bubbles and it's very, very involved process. And, and, and of course the morel is a big wreck and it's upright. And uh, we had, it, it was just like the stars aligned and uh, we had tremendous visibility. It must've been 75 or 80 feet of visibility. And, uh, and I got just, you know, if I never take another underwater picture, that shot on the, right there is I mean it was the they Yitka and Becky did all the hard work putting those lights in the pilot house and whatever else yeah. and, all, and I just went behind Becky and took a picture of her taking a picture and uh, <laughs> for me it's just it's it, it you wouldn't believe such a thing was possible especially if you started diving when I did you could see the whole bow of the boat and uh, uh, totally totally extraordinary totally haunting and and uh, uh, so I came back from that dive just really inspired for the first time in a long time. And it occurred to me that, and then I got, I got to know her a little more. I, I shouldn't talk like this is some sort of done deal, but I started kind of looking at what she was doing and because of her ability and, and because of technology evolving the way that it has, she's doing things underwater on the Great Lakes. And because they are still a world-class repository of, of shipwrecks, uh, she's doing things and has done things that are have never been done before and are really extraordinary pictures. And, uh, so I put on my sort of uh, producer hat and, and thought sort of like the Fitzgerald project. I like to collaborate with people who are mm -hmm. smarter. Than me. And uh, so here was my thread, these two sort of extraordinary divers, women actually, which I find interesting as the parent of two young daughters. These are really extraordinary uh, athletes and, and, and artists. And so they're a great story all by themselves. And then, you have a tremendous uh, history and, and this sort of rock and roll gee whiz technology. And there's a little element of risk, which is always interesting. And uh, so you put that all together and you have a pretty interesting book project. So I've sort of sketched something out and, and uh, cool. it's about where it sits now. And anyone who knows me knows it may be another 20 years before anything happens. Sure. But, uh, in the meantime, I pick away at uh, sure. accumulating material what uh, what are we looking at here in these next couple if you well, this, this, gets, this gets into the some of the history in it this book is I, again i just outlined it so i don't know what the, exactly what i talked about but if you if you're from milwaukee you know that some of the original some of the most interesting dive history actually took place right here in our backyard uh, Des uh max Noel uh and desco uh, that shot of me in the heavy hard gear uh, heavy gear is, is desco does a sort of historic dive equipment dive once a year and they were at discovery world that uh, was two summers ago so i actually got to make a dive in a desco helmet jeez uh, what was that like chris i mean was that, is that I, 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 I hated like? it. i would never ever i hated it it was uncomfortable and you have this dump valve but you activate with your chin and if you don't pay attention to that the suit blows up you know, it's like a surface supplied uh, uh positive pressure setup and it's climbing of course the boots weigh as much as i do and if you tip over in the muck it, you can't get back up without oh, someone i didn't care i didn't care for it i'm glad i did it didn't care for it 
It looks claustrophobic uh, as hell. Yeah. So then if you back up, just and I'll wrap it up here. So you got Desco and then this uh, Max Noel wound up owning the, the Prince Willem. And uh, his plan, his big plan was to salvage, I believe, the Andrea Doria. And they That's used right. the uh, Willa, the Willie, they were going to use that as sort of a, a proof of concept. So he went out there and, and uh, he kind of swindled the record. <laughs> it's a great story. I won't go into the whole thing, but it, they were going to raise the Willem. They never were successful. But uh, the Milwaukee Journal, uh, sent, or Jermaki Journal it was at that time, uh, this fellow here, and his name escapes me, uh, he was one of their photographers, their staff photographers. Mm -hmm. And he built his own you know, underwater cameras. Were not, I, don't, I don't know that you could get them commercially in 1955. And... Uh, so I got these two images from when when the Sentinel Journal went all digital. They sold off all the old black and white prints. I found these uh, two oh, black cool. prints uh, of this this staff photographer who built his own underwater camera and then went down on the Prince William in 1955 and took that image on on the right there. Well, that's the auxiliary helm on the stern of the Prince William with the old double <laughs> hose right there. And so that's I thought that was just really really interesting. And of course, Ike Light started in Chicago and. So there's all this really interesting, the deepest dive, uh, world oh. record depth dive was done off Port Washington. So That's you can cool. talk a little bit about that and then kind of wrap it up into the modern age uh, with rebreathers and gee whiz uh, digital cameras. And yeah, the that's the earliest underwater photo I've ever seen on, on a Great Lake ship. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt yeah. that it is. That is the earliest. Aber photo. Abercrombie. Ta Thomas Abercrombie is the name of the photographer. And that's an old Aquala dry suit. <laughs> it's it's sure. just really vintage that's stuff. Amazing stuff, Chris. <laughs> Very amazing. Well, we are just about up on the time. Uh, I'm going to come back to the uh, to the regular screen here. Um, hopefully, we're still running. It looks like we are. Um, all right. And we're back. So, um, Chris, um, thanks so much for coming on and uh, giving us a walk through all the different things you've been involved in. You've really had a, a kind of a fantastically eclectic uh, a career, in, in, you know, in all sorts of different aspects, you know, um, of Great Lakes maritime history, from from you know hardcore diving to uh, you know exploring uh, you know Great Lakes uh, maritime uh, shipping culture, um, you know, and um, sort of uh, the history of the, the, the ships and their role in build in sort of the industrial revolution on the Great Lakes. So really uh, a lot of contributions. Um, and uh, thanks so much, not just for appearing on the show, but for, for all the work you've done over the years. It's, uh, really and thank you for uh, putting this thing together because uh, virtually all of your guests are people I admire greatly. And it's a really uh, kind of cool to have this venue to uh share experiences and it's certainly now in the age of covid where i haven't seen anyone for a year and a half but it's nice <laughs> you're me you're me both it, it uh, is something it's one of the one of the reasons we like to have the zoom room uh you know it's just because so many of us have been cooped up for so long i am going to get my shot though i uh i expect a call any day now and i'll drive down to the dane county coliseum and i think i'll get the whatever the one one time shot and uh right and, uh, if that happens i'll be able to go out again <laughs> yeah be careful my wife got that one and it kicked her butt the Ooh, Johnson. geez i got a i got a big expedition actually i'm going up to the the copper country and rick mixter and i are planning to do some uh work maybe around dollar bay when we're up there um should be he's kind of a hack but good luck i know i know all about yeah. him i'll try to i'll try to keep him in line um, so anyway, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm about to post the link to the Zoom room. I will also have this show up, uploaded to YouTube if you want to watch it. And uh, Chris, hang around uh, after we, uh, we close up. And uh, thanks again uh, for appearing, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Good night, everybody.